palette of purples and blues and soft pinks, summer colors, into, well, a color palette that's distinctly fall. Bright oranges, yellows, and reds. I love this time of year. It's a perfect time to take a ride through the mountains. We're heading into the Ozarks, where art and amazing scenery go hand in hand. We'll also take another trip to Charlottesville, Virginia, to the home of Thomas Jefferson, and tour his massive fruit orchard. I'll also share a few tips on maintaining kefir pear trees and planting marigolds. And for a little fun in the spirit of the season, I'll show you how to use chicken wire to make ghost maiden dresses for Halloween. So let's get started with the drive through the beautiful Ozark Mountains. Just sit back and enjoy. When it comes to preservation and beautification, American Bloom is proving that flowers of all colors are really green at heart. Well, American Bloom is a national awards program and has been operating for 11 years now, and we have participated in Fayetteville all 11 years. Now, I assume that there are certain criteria that American Bloom follows and then there, these, these cities or communities are judged, aren't they? Well, there are. There are six criteria, and judges are here for two days. The criteria are floral displays, landscaped areas, urban forestry, heritage preservation, environmental awareness, and also overall impression. So we're here at the beautiful square in Fayetteville, and I'm just curious, under America in Bloom, what criteria would this particular project relate to? Well, the square is, uh, solves a number of criteria issues. We have the landscaped areas. We also have the floral displays. The old post office is over 100 years old, so we meet the heritage display. Gerald, here it is mid-October, and it's still showing out with lots of color. Oh, yes. Uh, this is a garden. Uh, the gardeners do a wonderful job of keeping this looking good. Uh, they rely on a lot of foliage color, uh, which carries the, the plants planting through the, the summer. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great lesson for gardeners of any level of experience to remember that foliage can carry the day. Right. You know, the main thing is uh, for a garden like this, it, it's in a high traffic area that has a lot of visibility, so they really spend the resources to keep it looking nice, and, and they're not so spread out that it's uh, too much to take care yeah, of. Yeah, that's the beauty of this, isn't it? It's very contained. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's okay. very inspiring and great work with the Botanic Garden. Okay, well, good day. Thanks a lot. You bet. Yeah. I'm enthusiastic about the program is how it has brought the community together and we have common goals to not only improve the beauty of the community but also the environmental efforts. <laughs> Very good, thank you so much. Okay. One of the best places to experience the beautiful colors of autumn is the Ozark Mountains, and nestled right in the middle of them is a fascinating place that combines the power of art with the beauty of the landscape. Crystal Bridges has only been open a year and it feels like the landscape has a certain level of maturity just in a short year. I think that's a surprise when people come here. They're like, this has been planted for, what, five, six years? <laughs> yeah. And I'm a like, great no. compliment to you <laughs> and your staff. About 10 months. Um, I think the key to that was we're going to build this museum right here and we're only going to, we're going to have the smallest footprint possible. So oh. we're only going to take out a minimal amount of trees. Where the building is, we're only going to take out six feet behind the building. What better way to make it look like it, this site, the landscape and the building had been here for years to use the native, just have the forest drop down. So use the same plants that we saw in the Ozarks um, that are out in the forest 
And so we didn't have a, a contrast near as much as if we would have built a botanical garden that people have said, ah, you know, azaleas, right. azaleas. Yeah. No, these, these are plants that, that you would find if we walked up this hillside right here. Yeah. You know, Scott, I really enjoy interfacing with all these vistas of water, whether it's a, a pond like this, of still water that reflects the trees and sky or the, around the building itself or the stream. Well, you know, I think that a lot of people thought that the landscape was just gonna be a side note to the architecture. Mm. So this is one area that, that we knew that people would tend to gather around. And mm. then- It's uh, just beautiful. Now this is the pond from which the museum is named. It is, so Crystal Pond in the spring is less than 60 or 70 feet to the east of here. But one of the surprises for me is that we have people that come to the grounds who have never stepped foot in the museum. And I, I always thought they were coming here just to get from point A to point B to go right, to the museum. Right, to see the art. And so I would interview them and they're like, no, we've never been. But then they finally step in. And then we have people that only go to the museum that are experiencing nature for the very right. first yeah, time. Yeah. So it's a win-win. Oh, it's just, it's, it's very inspiring. Just take a look at all of this color provided to us by these gorgeous marigolds. You see, what I did this year, I decided to have a little fun. I planted a double row. So what you see here is really the width created by two rows of little seedlings. And I took about eight different varieties of marigolds and I mixed them all together and I sewed this double row all the way down. This is about a 60 foot row and I just wish you could smell the aroma. It's fantastic. You know marigolds have been grown in American gardens for a long time. In fact Thomas Jefferson grew marigolds at Monticello in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Now marigolds are a great plant for the modern garden. You certainly don't have to plant as many as I have in this big vegetable garden. In small vegetable gardens, they can be equally beautiful and effective. You see, there's certain qualities about marigolds that serve as a repellent to certain pests. And there's no easier flower to grow from seed. In fact, the seed will germinate in about five to seven days. You just wanna make sure you plant the seed in warm soil. They need a sunny location, and you just need to keep the moisture of the soil consistent. Now, one of the things about this arrangement of marigolds that's so beautiful is the variety. If you look closely, you'll find lemon yellow, golden yellow, orange, variegated, and even some striped varieties. Marigolds are certainly an old-fashioned flower, but I guarantee you, if you plant them in your garden or even grow some in containers, they'll always put a smile on your face. Another interesting thing about marigolds is that the petals are edible. They've got a nice little flavor to them. And another interesting thing about the fact that these colorful petals are edible is that they're often blended into poultry feed. You see, the color of the yolk of an egg is really dependent on what you feed your chickens. So if you're feeding chickens, say wheat, which is largely white and brown, what you're going to get is a, a very light colored yellow yolk. If you feed chickens, for instance, a lot of corn, which is very orange and yellow like these marigolds, you're gonna get a much darker, richer, golden, even orange yolk. So by blending some of these petals within the feed, you can actually increase the color of the yolks of your eggs. You can look on the back of some brands of poultry feed and you can actually see marigold petals listed. And the reason why is because that feed is meant to help give those eggs, or at least the yolk of the egg, a much darker, richer color, which I find very desirable. These pears here at the farm always garner comments from visitors. It's the way we grow them. 
See, I'm growing them on espalier trees, trees grown on a single plane. And this particular pattern is called the candelabra pattern. And you can see that shape with this tree here behind me. Now this variety of pear is one called a kefir pear. And it's a cross between a European pear and an Asian pear. Now what I like about this pear is it's a really tough plant. These plants can live in a garden for up to 50 years. And I've seen the trees grow as high as 35 or more feet tall. Now, what happens this time of year, late in summer, they begin to ripen. These are almost ready to pick. They'll get a little bit of a blush on them that's sort of slightly bronze or red. And you want them to ripen as much as possible because the flesh of this pear, while it's white, it's very grainy. And the more they ripen, the more that graininess or grittiness smooths out in the flesh. Now, this is a pear I've been familiar with my whole life. In fact, I know at least four generations of my family have grown them. And they're very good for the South because this particular pear takes the heat. Now, they bloom in the spring and we get lots of honeybees pollinating, which is very important. And you also need to know you need at least a couple of trees for a good fruit set, good pollination. Then through the growing season, I come through and take out a lot of excessive limbs and leaves to make sure that the pears are getting plenty of sunlight. My grandmother used to make pear preserves and she would use those at the table also in cooking. They make delicious cakes. I like to bake these and they're excellent for desserts. Peter, the view of the orchard from up here on the vegetable terrace is really spectacular today here at Monticello. Well, I think this was really a consciously designed perch for Jefferson. Um, even the garden pavilion, what was sometimes called the garden temple at the halfway point of the garden, uh, was referred to as an observatory by a couple of people who came to Monticello. So this was obviously a, a place designed by Jefferson to look out upon what he called the workhouse of nature. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but the orchard really was one of Jefferson's first expressions on the landscape here at Monticello. Right, he, he began planting his uh, orchard two years before he began building the house at Monticello. Not an unusual thing. Uh, fruit growing in early America really meant horticulture in the sense there was much more energy devoted to the growing of uh, apples and peaches and grapes than any other form of gardening. Uh, most nurseries sold only fruit trees and uh, most of the instruction about growing things uh, focused on how to grow fruit. He really spent his, his life uh, adding new varieties of fruit trees. I mean, I know some of them would die and he would just have to replace them, but that was sort of an ongoing pursuit, wasn't it? Right, it was, um, it was a revolutionary orchard in the sense that um, Jefferson documented planting 170 varieties of the fanciest fruits that were known at the time. Um, 37 varieties of peach and 18 varieties of apple. Uh, so it was a great uh, collection for Jefferson, which he could uh, 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 taste these things and he'd make these sweeping proclamations about how this was the finest apple he'd ever tasted or the greatest <laughs> fig he'd ever known. Uh, one of Jefferson's favorite eating apples was the Newtown or Albemarle Pippin. And uh, there was a great industry that evolved in this county based on the exportation of that apple to England. Now figs were a big part of, of, of the garden or I guess the orchard or fruit production here at Monticello as well, weren't they? He loved figs. There are stories about him going out with his family and harvesting them. Uh, he brought back a variety from France called the Marseille that's a, it's a white tip fig with a yellow covering. Um, so he loved, loved figs at a time when figs were sort of a controversial item. Having figs or fresh fruit at the table was uh, really something that the upper classes, both here in England and Europe, um, it, was, it was something that you experienced when you dined. Oh, certainly. Uh, it was an affirmation and confirmation of one's place in the world. Uh, but I'd say for Jefferson, it was uh, partly experimental. Uh, he wrote one time that if uh, he failed 99 times out of 100, and sometimes it seemed like he did, uh, <laughs> that one success was worth all that effort. You know, there's just something about Halloween that brings the kid out in me. Who doesn't like to decorate for Halloween? And when you could come up with some unique, fun ideas like these, it makes it even more special. These are ghost maidens. They're fashioned after the style one would have worn before the Civil War. So they're antebellum girls, and what's wonderful about them is that they represent sort of the haute couture of the time with these big hoop skirts. And what you'll find is that these are frightfully easy to make. 
The first thing you're going to want to do is make sure you're fully armed wearing protective gloves and long sleeves because the form is made from chicken wire. Now to make this easy on you, what you want to buy is a 48 inch tall roll of chicken wire, one inch mesh. You can pick this up at the hardware store or a home improvement store. With the chicken wire ready, what you want to cut off is 28 inches of length and you're going to form it into a tube shape and secure the tube together by folding the cut pieces of wire together. You see this forms the torso and the base of the ghost dress. To form the torso of the maiden, what you want to do is squeeze the wire about a third of the way down from the top to make the waist of the dress. Then cut the back of the torso into a half moon shape and make a scoop in the back. Fold any wire that's sticking out toward the inside of the dress. Okay, now for the skirt. You can make it any length you want. You see, I cut mine a little longer than the length from the waist past the base. I did this because I wanted the skirt to be fuller and more generous. Fold the top of each skirt piece in toward the middle of the wire. You'll find that this also helps to contour the wire to the form of the waist. Now you'll want to make sure that each of these pieces that make up the skirt are secured with some wire. Then simply form the skirt into any shape you like and work with the torso to make it in the form of a corset. And then as a final touch to deck out your maidens, just take some cheesecloth like this, and it's just a matter of applying pieces any size you like. Large pieces, small pieces, drape it around, do swags, cascades, any way you want to give your maidens that sort of spooky and ethereal look. Now you want to make sure you secure these to the ground, and you can use these tent stakes that you can pick up, well, at most stores. Otherwise, when a high wind comes along, these girls will take flight. The other thing that you can do to bump up the spook factor is to illuminate them at night. I find that one light like this mounted slightly in the distance from them but shining toward them is really all you need to give them that extra little spark. Hey, I hope you have a happy Halloween. Have a little fun and use your imagination. At every step along the way in building this house, energy efficiency has been at the top of the priority list. And today, we're about to get our Energy Star rating. You see, the rating is based on a blower door test. So that will determine whether we end up with a 10, which I know we're not, because we've put a lot of effort in this, or closer to zero. Nobody can get zero, but if we can get close to that, I'll be really happy. This is the last step. It's always... Uh... It's kind of nerve-wrenching because if we, if we don't make a certain mark, we may have to come back and do a little bit more work to make sure we get to what we need. So who isn't interested in saving money? You know that most of the energy that we use in our homes really goes to heating and cooling the house. Well, today, these guys are installing the mini split system. It's kind of a cross between conventional central heat and air and the old fashioned window unit. So with the mini split, you're actually investing in the future because you know, you're gonna spend a little more up front than you would for a standard heat and air system. But over time, it pays for itself. To help save money, one of the things we did here in the house was to take and use barn roofing, this tin you see up here, for our ceilings. Well, the cost was a considerable savings. I also used the same material in the master bedroom over here, but the finish application is a little different. Come on in here, let me show you. Of course, in the kitchen, I kept the ceiling natural, galvanized because it matches all the appliances. And here I decided to paint the ceiling. So this is the same galvanized ceiling but we put two coats of snow white flat paint up here. And I think it works really well with the molding. It's a thing of beauty. You know, we came into this knowing that we had to score uh, at least a seven to meet our energy code. And we had, to, we had to test at least a five to make Energy Star, and we tested out a two. All right, we got a two, that's awesome. I would have never thought we would have gotten that low, so that's wonderful. We'll save a lot of energy over time with this, 
And believe me, on a day like today, I am feeling it. It's 106 outside. So they're gonna begin to turn the air on and we're gonna start feeling good in here. You know, it's really amazing what just the right landscape job can do for a property. Now take this one for instance, it belongs to a guy by the name of Jerry with a wife named Jenny. They've not lived here very long and they really want to make some improvements to the front. They have a long list of things that they would love. They love spring flowering bulbs such as tulips, daffodils, all kinds of annuals and Jerry really would like to have some vegetables. The only problem is the only sunny part of their property is in the front yard. So let's take on this challenge. Now, the first thing that I would do is tend to think about the entryway, changing it. It's very tight here, you can see. So what I'm wondering about is if we could bring this entry and let it sweep around like this, maybe with some cut flagstone rather than going with this washed pea gravel they have here. So let me just erase this and let's start with that idea. So we're gonna take, come out here like this and like this with a walk. Now this tree, this big red oak tree in the front yard is a problem because it casts a lot of shade near the house, but here on the front, it gets a lot of sun. Uh, the problem in the back is the grass won't grow. So what I'm gonna suggest is that Jerry create a bed that then does this around the base of the tree and sweeps around to that side of the house. So this becomes lawn here. We have lawn here. And then we would do landscaping back in this area. This is a perfect opportunity to do some beautiful little trees like, uh, for instance, a Japanese maple or dogwood back here. And also maybe another one right here on this corner like this. A tree that won't get too large then underplant this with a wide range of azaleas. I think the existing shrubs can remain, but just fill this in all across the back and around the tree. And then here I would add a ground cover across the front, probably using something like English ivy or maybe even a Virginia creeper. And then along here use that same ground cover. Although this could also be a bed for color here because they really would like to make that entrance more inviting. So this could be a flower border, and this flower border could continue on this side as well. Just think of those tulips blooming in the spring, underplanted with some beautiful pansies. Now for the vegetables. Over here, there's about 20 feet of space. There's about 24 feet of distance from the curb to the house. So what I suggest is that behind the mailbox here, you see you could create this raised bed, and this is where you could have tomatoes growing in the back, which would get tall, and then in the middle ground, squash and so forth, and then plant across the front some herbs, like Italian flat leaf parsley, as well as oregano and thyme. Well, Jerry and Jenny, I hope this is helpful. Good luck with your project. You know, I always look forward to the fall because I can just sort of kick back and enjoy so many of these vibrant, beautiful colors. Just take a look at this, most of it right from the garden. Fall allows me to take it easy, unlike spring when I'm ramping up in the garden. Hey, if you've got some photographs of some beautiful fall arrangements or foliage that you've seen, post them on my Facebook page. I'd love to see them. Until next time for The Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com. Imagine the spooks inhabiting this halt couture. And the plot will end here. <laughs> Try to put a ceiling in for 150 bucks. You think it's funny? You think it's funny? <laughs> yeah. Got it. Two. Can we use this board somewhere else? Yep. Okay, good. No waste, no waste. Play the dog. Do you want to see the birds? Took the, took the lamb. What kind of tree is this?